This program is, as the title here indicates, is a condensation of the original series of programs on biblical archaeology. In uh, fairly quick succession, the, uh, the main evidence um, in those programs is uh, going to be presented, um, elimin eliminating a lot of the, um, the, the background material that was in the original programs. The original programs are in the video section of our website, indicated on the screen here, www.bibletruthrestored.org. <clears throat> According to the early chapters of Genesis, around 2300 BC, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth, and uh, nations developed, uh, developed from them and uh, migrated. Genesis chapter 10 says Ham's grandson was named Sidon and his name has been preserved in the coastal city of Sidon in uh, uh, Lebanon, seen up the top of the screen here. Other names in Genesis 10 still preserved today are uh, Gaza, which is um, down here, and uh, Elam, now Iran. These biblical names are over 4,000 years old and uh, confirm the historical references made to them in the early chapters of the Bible. Other cities mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 are Babel, Erek, Akkad and Kauna. Um, prior to archaeology, critics claimed these names were invented by the Bible and that they were fictitious. But the existence of these cities has been confirmed by the archaeologists. For example, the inscription on this ancient door socket refers to the city of Akkad. And this ancient four-sided block has a reference on it to the city of Erech. Reference to Babel in Genesis chapter 10 is, of course, to Babylon, which the critics also at one stage claim never existed until the archaeologists dug it up as seen here. We're uh, looking at just a small section of what was unearthed here, and I'll be saying more about this later. Genesis chapter 10 refers to cities built to the north of Babylon in an area called Asher, which later became the centre of the Assyrian Empire. Nineveh and Nimrud were two of the cities uh, mentioned there, which you see at the top of the map there. For centuries, there was no evidence of these cities. However, during the 19th century, British and French archaeologists unearthed them, a section of which is seen here, and I'll say more about that later in this program. In 1854, a British team excavated a brick mound in southern Iraq, hoping to find treasure. Starting from the top, they tore the structure down, removing thousands of bricks. Turned out the structure was originally an ancient Mesopotamian temple tower known as a ziggurat and looked something like this. During excavation, they found four clay cylinders covered with ancient cuneiform writing. They were sent to the British Museum and this is one of them here. The cuneiform writing referred to the name of the place where they were found, namely Ur, and the name of the king, namely Namu. This was significant because the Bible referred to Ur as the name of the city from which Abraham came. But due to no reference being found to Ur in secular records, the critics and the sceptics said there was no such place, the whole Abraham story was a myth, and the Bible makes it up as it goes along. Since the discovery of Ur, the name has cropped up many more times as a result of excavations. The tablet being examined here, for example, refers to Ur. On this ancient four-sided block seen before, there's a list of kings who reigned at Ur, written in the old cuneiform script. And so I could go on. Many, many more examples could be given. Royal tombs are also unearthed at Ur, containing many artefacts, such as musicians' decorative harps with bull's heads. The harp or lyre is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 4, verse 21, eight generations after Adam, but some critics used to argue it was absolutely impossible. 
they maintained that such musical instruments were not invented till around 1000 BC. However, the harps found at Ur dated back long before them, confirming the biblical account. In the 1930s, a place called Mari was unearthed, which you see on the, the map here, around here. <clears throat> Ancient tablets were found there dating back to 2300 BC. Nearly 24,000 tablets actually were found in the royal archives of the palace inscribed with messages. Among them were messages from Ur and other cities and places mentioned in Genesis that used to be rejected as unhistorical. In northwest Syria, there's a place called um, Ebla, which you see in red up here. Like Mari, it was not known in the past until it was found and unearthed by the archaeologists. Many ancient tablets were found there, written in the oldest Semitic language known, from which other related languages such as Hebrew came, in which most of the Old Testament of the Bible was written. This was significant because it was previously argued that the Hebrew language did not originate till much later. For this reason, critics argued that Moses could not possibly have written the laws of God. But the tablets found at Ebla absolutely refuted that. Over 15,000 cuneiform tablets were found in the library of the Royal Archives containing a massive amount of information. Reference was found to Sodom and Gomorrah, which critics once denied their existence, providing evidence once again of the historicity of the Bible. Even Time magazine, in October of the 18th, 1976, referred to the Ebla tablets and said, quote, they provide the best evidence to date that some of the people described in the Old Testament actually existed. Genesis chapter 12 verse 10 tells us that famine in the land of Canaan caused Abraham to go to Egypt for relief. And critics used to argue this was not possible due to a closed door policy of the Egyptians at the time. However, this wall painting in an Egyptian tomb dating back to Abraham's time actually depicts a Semite family visiting Egypt. After Abraham returned to Canaan, his servants dug a well at Beersheba. And this ancient well here dates back to Abraham's time and is probably the one that his servants dug. Genesis chapter 23 records the death of Abraham's wife, Sarah. And it says that he purchased a field and a cave in Hebron for a burial site. 1,000 years later, Pharaoh Shishak invaded Israel and conquered many towns and localities and set up a relief in Egypt to commemorate it. On the screen is a pencil drawing of the relief and the names of the towns and localities he conquered and recorded. One of them is, quote, the field of Abraham. The Bible says that the descendants of Abraham's grandson Esau migrated to the territory south of the Dead Sea, which is a very rugged mountainous area with peaks rising to over 1,000 metres or 3,500 feet, as you see in this picture here. Looking at the maze of mountainous peaks and ravines, there would seem to be no way through and very difficult to believe that anyone could or would want to live there. Yet the Bible says they did, and made their dwellings up in the mountains in the clefts of the rocks. But up until the 19th century, before Europeans explored the area, many believed that these references in the Bible were fictional, not historically factual. But hidden away in the great folds of the mountains lay one of the world's most rare and beautiful spectacles. I'm referring, of course, to the ancient rock-carved city of Petra, which we're looking down upon here. It was discovered in 1812 by the Swiss explorer Johann Burckhardt, 
but no doubt known to the local Arabs and mentioned long before in the Bible. To get into the city of Petra involved entering a narrow cleft in a rock wall, as you see here, and to follow a narrow gorge which penetrates the, um, the mountains. This gorge was the only way into the city, and it twists and turns for 1.2 kilometres between cliffs that are up to 100 metres, that is over 300 feet high. Nearing the end of the gorge, an ornate building lies ahead, carved out of a rock face. Here it is, it's called the Treasury, and is completely carved out of the face of the sandstone cliff. The area leading away from the treasury widens out to areas where there are numerous dwellings and tombs and temples carved out of the mountains. According to Genesis, Joseph predicted seven years of famine in Egypt. But this has been questioned because due to having the River Nile, Egypt does not depend on rainfall. However, the inscription on this rock on an island at the Nile's first cataract refers to failure of the Nile to overflow its banks for seven years in succession, resulting in famine of exceptional severity. The book of Exodus records Israel's time in Egypt as ill-treated slaves of Pharaoh, during which they were forced to make bricks. Many bricks have been found bearing a Pharaoh's seal, as seen here. An inscription has also been found which says PR, which stands for Semites in the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Ancient bricks have also been found minus straw, which is significant because the Bible does refer to a period when the Egyptians stopped supplying straw um, for the bricks that the Israelites were making. Moses was born in Egypt, as we know, at the time, and uh, adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, Hatshepsut, who named him Moses. This here is actually a statue of Hatshepsut that has been found. Moses was not a Hebrew name. The Hebrew is Mosh. Moses was an Egyptian name represented by M.S. in the Egyptian hier hieroglyphs, which contain no vowels. It formed part of Pharaoh's name, which was Thutmos, or Thutmoses, who was seen here. These are the facts, and Egyptologists know it. So the name Moses was quite consistent with the circumstances described in the Bible. Seen here is Luxor, known as Thebes in biblical times. It became the ancient capital of Egypt. Egyptian temples and tombs are there, the walls of which have been dubbed a history in stone due to the inscriptions that cover them. References are made to Pharaoh Ramses, Pharaoh Necho, Pharaoh Tuhaka, etc., etc., who are all also mentioned by name in the Bible, indicating again how historically accurate the Bible is. The great city of Thebes was ultimately conquered and vandalised by the Assyrians. And this is referred to in the Bible in the book of Nahum, chapter 3, verse 8. Of particular interest are reliefs relating to a battle with the Sea Peoples, referred to as the Palisat, which refers to Palestine, from which the, uh, the name Philistine is derived. The Philistines are referred to many times in the Bible. Goliath was one of them, and he was uh, the giant who um, David killed. Well, the Egyptians defeated them in battle and took prisoners. And in this pencil drawing, taken from the relief of a line of them being interrogated and listed by Egyptian scribes, you can see there how the Philistines are notably taller than the Egyptians. The Valley of Kings, of course, is at Luxor, where Tutankhamun's tomb was found, along with 60 other pharaohs' tombs. Every direction in which one turned is Tutankhamun's, um, in Tutankhamun's tomb. It was stacked 
with tre treasures of gold, silver and precious stones. Nearly 5,000 items actually, estimated to be worth well over a billion dollars. <throat> But Tutankhamun was only 19 when he died. He was not very significant politically. He was dwarfed, in fact, by other pharaohs, and his tomb was very modest by comparison. Yet what fabulous treasures were found in it. The mind boggles at the thought of the wealth of treasures that must have been in the tombs of the other richer and more powerful pharaohs, which incidentally were all robbed. This confirms the reference in the Bible in Hebrews 11 verse 26 to the treasures, that is the great wealth in Egypt in Moses' day. And interestingly enough, a prophecy in Daniel 11 verse 40 refers to an anti-Israel army invading Israel in the end time and pressing on down to uh, Egypt <clears throat> resulting in gaining control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt. That is how it reads. When this prophecy was given about 535 BC, Tutankhamun's treasures were literally hidden, having been buried in his tomb for 790 years at the time. The tomb wasn't found until 1922. Another prophecy in Ezekiel 29 verse 14 predicted that Egypt would become a low and weak base nation. So on the face of it, the reference to treasures in Egypt in the end time seemed uh, contradictory. It seemed impossible but not since Tutankhamun's treasures were found and stored in Cairo's museum, some of which we have been looking at. Prior to the Israelites making their exodus out of Egypt, Exodus chapter 12 says they were told to request gold, silver and jewellery from the Egyptians to be used to make items for the tabernacle, such as the gold menorah or lampstand, which you see here. It has been estimated that 1,500 kilograms, that's one and a half ton of gold, was involved. But the sceptics used to ridicule this, claiming there wouldn't have been that much gold in all of Egypt. Well, that ridicule quickly stopped after the archaeologists discovered Tutankhamun's tomb. I'd now like to refer to the Hittites, referred to 48 times in the Bible, which indicates they were a powerful empire in their time. But up until the 19th century, there was no reference to them in secular history. No trace of them could be found outside the Bible. So the critics claimed the Bible was unhistorical and unreliable. Even early editions of Encyclopedia Britannica described the Hittites as, quote, a legendary Bible nation. And they gave a small paragraph of eight and a half lines just summarising what the Bible said about them. However, French explorer Charles Texier came across these mysterious ruins at a place called Hattusa in central Turkey, which turned out to be the ruins of an ancient Hittite city. Strange hieroglyphic type writing was also found, which no one could read at the time. Eventually the code was cracked and the Hittite source was revealed and confirmed. We now come to the Exodus, that is Israel's journey out of Egypt to Mount Sinai. Galatians 4 verse 24 says Mount Sinai was in Arabia, so the journey would have taken the route indicated on the map here, the way to Arabia, that's the way they would have gone. <clears throat> but Exodus 14 verse 2 says that at a certain point along this route, before they reach Elot, that's easy on Geba, the Lord told them to turn off, resulting in them ending up on the shore of the Red Sea, also known as the Gulf of Aqaba. And you can see that 
um, indicated on the map here. There's only one place along this route from Egypt to Arabia where you can turn off and end up at the Gulf. And it's indicated again on this map. <clears throat> the road leads for 30 kilometres, about 18 miles, to the sea through a wadi, that is a dry riverbed, through which a proper road runs today. It leads out onto a wide expanse of beach, seen here, which is known today as Nueba. It's seven kilometres, about four and a half miles long, just over five kilometres at three and a half miles wide, large enough to accommodate the estimated two million Israelites. You can see the beach quite clearly on the satellite picture of the uh, area, that little white dot there. <clears throat> Pharaoh and his troops came after them, heading down the wadi to the beach with their horses and chariots, but the Lord set up a pillar of fire at the entrance to the beach to hold them back all night. During the night, the Lord divided the sea by a divinely empowered um, forceful wind and then congealed the two walls of water, holding them in place, creating a path between them, enabling the Israelites to walk the 16 kilometres or 10 miles across to Arabia. We know that the beach at Nueba was a departure point of the Red Sea crossing because this Phoenician-style granite column was found there in 1978 with an inscription on it which indicated that Solomon, king of Israel, set it up as a memorial of the event. An identical column was also found on the Arabian side, but when the Arabian authorities were notified, they removed it. This picture shows the position of the Nuweban column in relation to the, uh, the sea. It is significant that the column was of Phoenician style because they made the columns for Solomon's temple. According to 1 Kings chapter 9, Solomon had an alliance with the Phoenicians which involved sailing ventures up and down the Red Sea Gulf past the sites where the columns were found. When the Lord withdrew the pillar of fire, the Egyptians pursued the Israelites, but the divided sea came crashing down on them. So in view of this, the strip of sea between the two columns at Nueba and Arabia became very significant. So diving teams have done underwater investigation to see if there's any sign of Egyptian chariot parts on the seabed there. They discovered outcrops of coral in weird, unusual shapes, some resembling the shape of chariot wheels and axles scattered over the seabed like this one and this one. Wheels and axle have been superimposed in this picture to indicate what the object originally looked like. When a metal detector was run over these coral encrusted formations, traces of metal could be detected. Once Israel arrived on the Arabian side of the Gulf, they headed for Mount Sinai. On their way, they encamped at a place called Elam, where there was an oasis, which is still there today, as you see in this picture. Finally, they arrived at Mount Sinai, seen here. It's the highest mountain in the entire region, being 2,600 metres. That's about 8,228 feet high. This map shows the position of Mount Sinai and uh, outlines the whole journey from uh, Egypt. The top section of the mountain is black, as if scorched or charred by fire. It's the only mountain in the region like this, and it is not a volcano. This feature is consistent with the biblical record, which says fire descended upon the mountain when God came to it, causing it to smoke. 
Exodus 24 verse 4 says, Moses built an altar out of stones at the foot of the mountain and remnants of it are still there today as you see in this picture which was taken on the site. Exodus 32 tells us that while Moses was up Mount Sinai, the Israelites made a bull calf and built an altar further out from the base of the mountain. The position is indicated in the, the bottom left of uh, this diagram. Significantly enough, this pile of large stones was found in that area with inscriptions, that's petroglyphs, of cattle and bulls etched into the stones. The distinctive horns resemble those found in the temples and the tombs of ancient Egypt of the sacred Egyptian bull god Apis, such as you see here. But Arabia was never Egyptian territory, and no such carvings have been found anywhere else in Arabia. Obviously, people who had come from Egypt put them there. And the identity of those people is indicated by this rock inscription found in the area, an image of the seven-branch lampstand kept in Israel's tabernacle. It's the oldest image of the menorah ever found, showing Israel's presence in the area. Exodus 25 verse 10 says, Moses was told to build the tabernacle out of acacia wood. Not surprisingly, the acacia is indigenous in the Sinai region. The Bible's references to trees and birds, including quails, geography, topography, history, etc., etc., is always consistent with the facts. Nothing is ever put into the wrong time slot or into the wrong place. After 40 years in the wilderness, Joshua led Israel into Canaan. They had to cross the river Jordan, but it was in flood. But God told Joshua it would stop flowing, enabling them to cross over. Joshua 3 verse 16 says, The river dammed up further upstream at a place called Adam, causing the river to stop flowing, enabling Israel to cross over. Some have been sceptical about this, but it has happened several times since due to landslides. Some have therefore attributed it to natural forces, not supernatural. But it's overlooked that Israel was told the precise time that the river would stop flowing. Even today, seismologists cannot predict the precise day or hour of an earthquake or a cave-in and have everybody standing by ready and waiting for it. So then Joshua led Israel into Canaan, the promised land, and embarked upon crusades to conquer the Canaanites and take possession of the land. But this has been disputed. Some think there's no physical evidence for it. There are, however, volumes of archaeological evidence um, for it, and we have programs on the internet uh, dealing with that. <clears throat> when Joshua led Israel into Canaan, Jericho was first on the hit list. Israel marched around the city and all the walls fell down. The site of Jericho has been excavated by several different teams of archaeologists since 1868 and Garstang was one of them and he said this, quote, There remains no doubt the walls fell outwards caused by a divinely timed earthquake. Joshua chapter 8 goes on to say that Joshua led the Israelites to Shechem, a city which guarded a vital pass between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Mount Ebal is on the left of this picture here. Joshua 8 verse 30 says, Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal. And during an archaeological survey in 1980, these unhewn stones on Mount Ebal were examined and discovered to be the remains of the altar dating back to Joshua's time. Joshua 24 refers to Joshua setting up a stone witness at Shechem, and it is believed that this stone monument seen here is the one that was originally set up by Joshua. 
this well is also at Shechem, where Jacob's well was dug, and it's believed to be it. It is actually regarded as one of the most authentic historical sites. When Israel entered Canaan under Joshua, they were told to destroy all Canaanite idols and shrines. The Canaanites worshipped many gods, and Baal was the chief one. Many statues or images of him have been found. This one on the screen is a bronze one of him. Baal was often associated with the Canaanite goddess Ashtoreth or Ashtart, a fertility goddess seen here and obviously quite a tart. Under the leadership of Joshua, Israel conquered and possessed Canaan. After Joshua's death for the next 400 years, Israel had a number of leaders called judges. This particular period of history is recorded in the biblical book of Judges. During this period, a place called Shiloh was the chief centre in Israel and the tabernacle and later a temple was there till destroyed by the, uh, the Philistines. <clears throat> the site of Shiloh has been found and excavated as can be seen in this part of the site in the uh, picture. Samuel was the last judge and Saul became the first king of Israel. The Bible says he ruled from a place called Gibeah, which you'll notice here on the map. The Philistines actually ended up destroying it. The archaeologists have unearthed the ruins of Saul's citadel, the first royal castle, and you're looking at it here in this picture. This brings us to the time of David, around 1000 BC. After his encounter with Goliath, he became king and took his army to conquer Jerusalem, which was occupied by the Jebusites, a branch of the Canaanites. At the time, Jerusalem looked something like this. The city occupied a long, narrow ridge protected by high fortification walls and surrounded by valleys. The, valley, the valleys around the ridge are more pronounced in this picture. But the biblical account of David's capture of the city was obscure until the archaeologists came on the scene. Due to the valleys and high walls around the city, it seemed impregnable. But 2 Samuel 5 says David issued a challenge for someone to climb up the gutter into the city at night and unlock the gates. But for a long time, no one knew what was meant by the gutter. The explanation takes us to the Gihon Spring on the eastern side of the ridge in the Kidron Valley, as indicated in this picture here. In this old photo, the house at the bottom of the slope with a red dot on the top is where the entrance to the spring is. See down here? <clears throat> Due to the accumulation of debris from the city over thousands of years, the spring, which was originally at ground level and which overflowed into the valley, ended up having to be approached by a descent of 30 steps into the hillside. In this picture, we're inside the grotto of the spring, looking back up the flight of steps that descend into the spring. Well, in 1867, this British engineer, Charles Warren, was making a survey of Jerusalem for the Palestine Exploration Fund, exploring underground Jerusalem, and he visited the spring. And he noticed that this vertical shaft went up above the spring in the roof of the cave. Apparently, no one had noticed it before because when he made inquiries, no one could tell him anything about it. It turned out that the shaft was 16 and a half metres at 54 feet high by 1.8 metres at 6 feet wide. The man in this picture is going up on a rope ladder as a demonstration. And here he is coming out the top. In this picture, we're looking down the shaft. 
This is what is referred to in the Bible as the gutter. The Jebusites lowered vessels down um, on ropes to get water and they regarded it as impossible to climb without a rope attached to the top. But the commander of David's army, Joab, managed to scale the shaft and get into the city at night and unlock the gate through which David and his men entered and conquered the city. As indicated in this diagram, the, uh, the gutter included a tunnel that ran up from the top of the shaft underground through the hill into the city inside the walls. But when the shaft was discovered, the tunnel was blocked. No one even knew where the city entrance was. I'm sure you can all follow this. Uh, this is coming down the steps into the, the grotto or the spring. And then uh, here's the vertical shaft up here. And this is, this is the, the gutter or the extension of the gutter leads up into the, into the city behind the city wall there. <clears throat> It was not until 1978 that the excavation of the tunnel that was led up into the city took place and this picture was taken during the process. Removal of the rubble caused a cave-in up the hillside exposing this gable roof formed by large stone slabs. It turned out uh, to be the entrance to the tunnel that led down to the water shaft. The Israelis opened the site for tourists, built iron steps over the original steps, which were carved out of the rock. Finding the gutter that David's soldier climbed was a significant discovery. But ironically enough, up until that time, no evidence or reference to David himself had been found by the archaeologists. That is, until 1994, when this inscription was found referring to, quote, the house of David and the king of Israel. This discovery actually made the front page of the New York Times and actually got into the Time magazine as well. Okay, David's son Solomon succeeded him as king of Israel. He lived during the 9th century B.C., the kingdom of Israel reached its peak of power and prosperity during his reign. 1 Kings 4 verse 21 records the extent of his kingdom. The territory mentioned is encompassed within the red line on this map with about 1,200 kilometres, that's 800 miles, from the Euphrates up north down to the border of Egypt. The story of Solomon's reign starts with his visit to a place called Gibeon. The mound on the screen is where Gibeon used to be and it has been excavated. Excavation in 1956 unearthed this ancient cistern with a spiral staircase, confirming 2 Samuel chapter 2, which says, In David's day, Israeli warriors fought to the death around this pool at Gibeon. 1 Kings 5 tells us that Hiram, king of Tyre, in the country of Phoenicia, that's Lebanon today, floated cedar trees down to Israel for the building of Solomon's temple. This limestone sarcophagus, or stone coffin, now in the Beirut Museum, was found in Lebanon and has an inscription on it along the whole length of the side of the, uh, the, the lid. You can see the, in, uh, the inscription all the way along there. It's the longest known inscription in early Phoenician script. Dates back to Solomon in David's time. The, inscri the inscription says it belongs to Ahiram, king of Phoenicia, confirming the biblical reference to him by name. The Bible says Solomon extended Jerusalem further north from the Jebusite Ridge up to Mount Moriah, where he built the temple, as indicated on this diagram. Mount Moriah became known as 
the temple mount. As shown on this diagram, the Israelites have had three temples involving different sized areas on the mount. The yellow section represents Solomon's area and his temple was built around 950 BC. It was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 BC. The Jews who returned from Babylon in 537 BC built the second temple and later in the second century BC the mount was extended. Then in 19 BC Herod rebuilt the temple and started extending the platform further. So that's why you have the three different um, colours there on that diagram. Two Muslim mosques sit on the mount today, but Solomon's temple was built there about 1,600 years before the mosques were put there, about 1,500 years before Mohammed was even thought of. Now, it should be pointed out that just as pottery and architecture change in shape and design and can be dated accordingly, so also can building blocks. They are among the archaeologists' best dating tools. As a result of this, they're able to ascertain the period of history to which sections of walls belong. Now, according to the Mishnah, it's a collection of Jewish laws compiled about 200 AD, Solomon's temple platform on the mount was 500 royal cubits square. That is 262.6 metres or 861 feet square, as indicated in the yellow section on the diagram here. Now, in 1969, a student of archaeology at the Tel Aviv University was walking around the graves with his camera by the eastern gate of the Temple Mount, which you see here, and he dropped into a grave. He ended up against the wall among skeletons and he took photos because, to his surprise, he noticed that on the wall, which was below the eastern gate, were wedge-shaped stones neatly set in a large arch, as you can see in this picture here. They were the remains of an earlier gate, evidently buried when Herod raised and enlarged the temple platform on the mount. It was concluded these stones represented the oldest and original section of the eastern wall of the temple built by Solomon. This diagram further illustrates the position of the tomb and the, uh, the arch seen um, in it. This line along here represents the ground level and uh, these are the old uh, original um, gates and uh, you can see this is the tomb and that little black area is the, the, the little bit of the arch that um, that gentleman photographed when he ended up in the, uh, in the tomb. <clears throat> now, on the opposite side of the Temple Mount, that is the western side, the bottom step in this flight of steps leading up to the mosque platform consists of masonry quite different from the uh, others. I'm talking about this step, uh, this one. You can see how different it is from the, from the rest of the steps up there. It's the same masonry as what we were looking at on the opposite wall, that is on the eastern wall where the grave is. The bottom step here was in fact part of the western wall of Solomon's temple enclosure. And significantly enough, as you can see here, the measurement from the bottom step on the western side to the eastern side is 500 cubits. Also, significantly enough, the, the bottom step, that's the top left corner of the yellow area, you can see it here, that bottom step there, does not run parallel with the other steps. These are the other steps here, 
but that bottom step does not run parallel with these. You can see the, you can see the trajectory of those steps by that, that line down there. <clears throat> Confirming it's not, it was not one of the original steps. However, it does run, run parallel with the eastern wall. So what I'm saying is this bottom step here runs parallel with this wall here. <clears throat> Confirming it was part of the western wall, the original western wall. It's also significant that when you measure 500 cubits down the eastern wall, down coming down here, you come to a slight bend in the wall where a column protrudes. It's mentioned, the, the bend is mentioned there. This is where Solomon's wall ends and where the second extension begins. So the 500 cubit square platform of Solomon's temple has been clearly revealed. The mount where the mosques stand today was clearly the mount where Israel's temples originally stood. The Muslims and others, including the United Nations Organization, claim Israel has no historical connection with the mount platform where the mosques sit today. They're either ignorant or in denial of the facts because the Bible and history clearly testifies that Herod rebuilt the Jewish temple mount and 10,000 Herodian stones in the lower courses of the wall are still there today testifying to this fact. They're still in place in the wall that goes around the temple mount where the mosque sits today, uh, proving that the mosques are on the mount where Israel's temple once stood. In AD 70, the Romans toppled the upper courses of the temple enclosure wall around the mount, leaving stones lying all around the base of the wall, as you see here, which the archaeologists have investigated. This large stone had fallen from a pinnacle or a parapet on the southwest corner and had an incomplete inscription on it. The inscription said, to the place of trumpeting. As this reconstruction shows, on the southwest corner of the Jewish temple enclosure wall was a special designated place for a priest to stand to blow the trumpet. He did this to announce the beginning and the end of the Sabbath as well as other Jewish holy days and festivals. Josephus, the first century uh, Jewish historian, describes the, this very spot as, quote, above the roof of the priest's chambers. This seven-branched menorah was found among the debris of Herod's temple. It was carved on the back of a sundial and confirmed the Jewish connection to the mount. Along the southern part of the Temple Mount, archaeologists uncovered several ritual immersion baths like this one cut into the bedrock. These ritual immersion baths served the Jewish pilgrims who came up to the temple, again confirming a Jewish temple was here. Likewise, this inscription was found, which originally belonged to the Temple Mount. It says, quote, No foreigner may pass the barrier and enclosure surrounding the temple. Anyone caught doing so will be himself to blame for his resulting death. End of quote. A Hebrew inscription was also found in 1969 carved into one of the wall stones under this arch, which is known as Robinson's Arch. The words are similar to Isaiah 66 verse 14 and express optimism that the Jewish temple would soon be rebuilt. This thumb-sized ivory pomegranate was found. It's thought to have been originally mounted on the head of the high priest's scepter. The inscription originally read, quote, belonging to the temple of Yahweh, holy to the priests. In 1997, this inscribed potsherd was found, referring to, quote, the house of Yahweh, 
which was a common designation for the Jewish temple at Jerusalem. Talking about Solomon, this side of a cylindrical seal used to stamp official documents spells Shlomo, the Hebrew name for Solomon. The other side of the seal depicts a royal figure bearing a scepter. The seal dates back to Solomon's time. Mention was made earlier to the pillars bearing Solomon's name on each side of the Red Sea, commemorating Israel's crossing back in Moses' day. 1 Kings 9 verse 28 says, Solomon's ships sailed to a place called Ophir and brought back 14,000 kilograms, that's 15 and a half tonne of gold. The return trip took three years. But the critics used to say, no, there was no such place as Ophir. The Bible makes it up as it goes along. However, an ancient inscription was found on a Hebrew potsherd, which you're looking at here, stating that such a place did exist. It says, quote, gold from Ophir to Beth Horon, 30 shekels. Critics used to also say there was no such person as Pontius Pilate because no reference could be found to him in secular records. But this inscription found among ruins on the coast of Caesarea refers to him. Now, 1 Kings chapter 7 tells us that a lot of brass was used in the construction of Solomon's temple. Two huge columns, 8 metres or 27 feet high, stood at the entrance of the temple, which you can see um, in this picture. There was a huge bronze laver, which hurled 40,000 litres of water. There were also 10 bronze carts and many bronze pots and pans, etc. Brass is not a natural product. To produce it requires mixing copper with zinc, but copper is the main element. So where did Solomon get all this copper from? A hint is given in 1 Kings 7, verse 45 to 46, which says all the bronze objects were cast in clay moulds in the plain of Jordan between Succoth and Zarthan. The Jordan Valley is part of the Rift Valley to which Timna belongs, where the archaeologists have found ancient copper mines. This is obviously where Solomon's copper came from. Timna, seen on the map here, is 30 kilometres, about 19 miles north of the Gulf of Aqaba, and the copper would have been transported north to a place in the Jordan Valley nearer to Jerusalem and poured into clay moulds there to make the items for the temple. Exploration in the Timna Valley has revealed a history of copper mining that goes back to Solomon's time and beyond. The hills are honeycombed with caves like this and over 7,000 mining shafts from which copper in particular has been extracted. Since the discovery of copper mines in the area and rich deposits of copper in the hills, mining started again. For some time now, Israel has been extracting ore deposits from mines in the Timna Valley. According to Deuteronomy 8 verse 9, God told Israel, even before they entered the promised land, that they would be able to dig copper out of the hills. And time has proved this to be so true. Solomon died around 926 BC. After his death, his kingdom divided. The tribes in northern Israel separated from the southern and they became rivals. The tribes in the north held on to the name Israel and those in the south were called by the name of the dominant tribe there, namely Judah, whose capital city was Jerusalem. During the centuries that followed, wars were often fought between the two kingdoms and a spiritual decline and weakening of power took place among them. At the same time, a strengthening of power was taking place in northern Mesopotamia, that's northern Iraq today, 
among the people known as the Assyrians. The Assyrians eventually invaded the northern kingdom of Israel and terminated it. They besieged the cities and destroyed them, killing many Israelites and taking many away as captives. Many references are made in the Bible to the Assyrians, the kings, their cities, their conquests. But in the past, this history was rejected by some due to no evidence being available that they ever existed until, of course, the archaeologists came on the scene. As a result of them finding and unearthing the Assyrians' capital cities, they found that they operated from four different cities, which is shown on the map up the top there. They were Asher, Kala, or Nimrod, Nineveh, and Kosabad, and were situated on the bank of the Tigris River. But prophecies in the Bible declared that the Assyrian cities would be destroyed and disappear. And this is what happened. This picture demonstrates the point. It was taken of the area where Nineveh, the great capital of the Assyrian Empire, once stood. The sands of time and ravages of nature covered and buried the ruins of the cities, just leaving bare mounds, as you see here. As you can imagine, years of hard work was required to excavate the sites and uncover the ruins. This aerial picture gives some idea of the extent of the excavation involved on just one of the sites. <clears throat> Multitudes of inscriptions on stone have been found in the ruins, which refer to Assyrian kings by name, who are all referred to in the Bible. And on the screen, they are listed in order of their reign. This statue of the first king, Ashurnasipal, was found among the ruins. Portraits of various kings carved in stone, like photos, have put a face to men who, up until that time, could only be read about in the Bible, but who some critics had rejected as being unhistorical and fictitious. In most of the principal doorways of the palaces, human-headed bulls like these stood, five and a half metres, about 18 feet high and long, and weighing up to 30 tonnes. Two of them stand at the entrance to the Assyrian section in the British Museum. On the basis of excavation, this is an artist's impression of what the interior of an Assyrian palace looked like in its prime and glory. One of the most significant discoveries was this obelisk pillar commemorating Assyrian victories. On one of the panels is Jehu, king of Israel, referred to by name in the Bible. He's depicted here kneeling in submission to the king of Assyria, paying tribute, revealing that Israel occupied her land well over 700 years BC. So many reliefs were found lining the corridors of the palaces, portraying Assyrian culture and history, that if they were all placed side by side in a row, they would stretch for three kilometres, nearly two miles. As you can see, the museum has, in a limited way, tried to recreate the spectacle by lining the walls with rows of some of the reliefs. One of the more dramatic scenes among the reliefs was lion hunting on horseback, as you see here. Not always on horseback either. The reliefs gave a pictorial uh, representation of every aspect of Assyrian life that you could think of and were a wealth of information about the Assyrian Empire. War scenes such as this were popular, commemorating various battles waged in the then known world. This relief depicts Sennacherib in his royal chariot referred to by name in the Bible, but again, once regarded by some as a myth. This hexagonal or six-sided clay prism was found in the ruins of Sennacherib's palace. In neat cuneiform writing, 
it records the principal military campaigns and victories of Sennacherib, including his campaigns against the Jews when Hezekiah was their king. A piece of history also recorded in the Bible, again confirming Bible's history and Israel's occupation of the land. The Bible also records Sennacherib's siege against the Jewish city of Lachish, and reliefs like this one were found in Sennacherib's palace depicting it. Statements are made in the Bible that the Assyrians were a very cruel, vicious, sadistic, aggressive nation that committed many atrocities against those they attacked and conquered. And reliefs around the walls of the Assyrian palaces have certainly confirmed the biblical descriptions. The Assyrians destroyed cities by literally tearing them apart stone by stone, as this relief depicts. They slaughtered men, women and children without mercy and impaled prisoners on stakes outside the city wall. Some had their eyes gouged out. Beheading was common. Many reliefs depict that, showing piles of heads. Men were burned alive or mutilated or tied to the ground and skinned alive. The Assyrians' reputation for savagery and sadism is referred to in the Bible as causing people to tremble with fear and go weak at the knees when they knew the Assyrians were on their way to invade. And the reliefs explain why and certainly confirm um, the biblical narrative. The Bible says Ahab was king of Israel and was defeated by Shalmaneser, king of Assyria at the time. And this has been confirmed by the discovery of Shalmaneser's inscribed still, which you're looking at here. The Bible also says Jezebel was Ahab's wife, and this seal was found bearing her name. Another king of Israel who lived during the Assyrian Empire was Ahaz. And on the screen you see a seal with an ancient Hebrew inscription which reads, quote, belonging to Ahaz. The Bible says in 2 Kings 18 verse 10 that the king of Assyria laid siege to Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel, and it lasted three years. Reference was found to this by the archaeologists in the records of the king of Assyria. He said, quote, I besieged and conquered Samaria. I led away into captivity 27,290 people who lived there. This confirms the biblical record in 2 Kings 17 verse 6, which simply says, quote, He carried Israel away to Assyria. Talking about sieges, references made in the Bible, for example in Ezekiel 26 verse 9, to engines of war, which some modern translations render battering rams, which the Assyrians used to to besiege cities and to break down walls. You're looking at an Assyrian relief of one in this picture. And here is another one. The archaeologists found a number of scenes relating to siege engines. This one here was actually displayed on a gate panel. When the archaeologists um, excavated the ruins of Samaria, they came across numerous splinters of ivory like these. Finding so much evidence of ivory at Samaria was very significant in view of a reference in the Bible, 2 Kings 22 verse 39, to the king of of Samaria, who was Ahab at the time, making an ivory house. Not only that, but Amos chapter 6 verse 1 refers to certain Jewish inhabitants of Samaria who had beds and couches inlaid with ivory. Significantly enough, the ivory bed head on the screen at the moment was among the items found at the site. Now the interesting thing is that when the archaeologists excavated the palace of the Assyrian king who conquered Samaria, 
They found items of ivory which matched the pattern and style of the pieces that were found at Samaria, such as these ones being shown on the screen at the moment. The Assyrian king Sennacherib, seen here again, is referred to 13 times in the Bible. And he invaded the southern kingdom of Judah when Hezekiah was their king reigning from Jerusalem. As we've seen, access to Jerusalem's water supply, the Gihon Spring, could be gained in the, in the Kidron Valley. So Hezekiah blocked and con uh, concealed the entrance to the spring to prevent the uh, Assyrians having access to the water. He dug a tunnel to run the overflow from the spring to a pool inside the city. The Bible records this in 2 Kings 20, 2 Chronicles 32, and Isaiah chapter 22. And the diagram shows the course of the tunnel from the spring to the pool of Siloam. The tunnel measures 534 metres, about 1,750 feet. That's about a third of a mile and is a very popular tourist attraction. A constant stream of tourists walk the length of the tunnel each year. Back in 1880, this inscription was found in the wall of the tunnel near the pool entrance and it was dug out and it confirms the biblical account of the digging of the tunnel. Now, talking about rock inscriptions, one dating back to the same period was found in this tomb here along the Kidron Valley, and it refers to Shebna, the manager of the royal household. Here it is. And believe it or not, the Bible in Isaiah chapter 22 refers to this Shebna, a high official or steward in King Hezekiah's court who was carving out a tomb for himself on the rocky hillside at Jerusalem. And there it is. The Assyrians were ultimately conquered by the Babylonians. The city of Babylon was the capital of their kingdom and was situated in southern Mesopotamia, that's southern Iraq, on the river Euphrates, about 400 kilometres, about 250 miles south of Nineveh. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, eventually invaded and conquered Judea, destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple, and took many Jews captive back to Babylon, including Daniel. On the basis of excavation, it's believed that Babylon looked something like this. There are literally dozens of references to Babylon in the Bible. Isaiah 13 refers to the city as the glory of all kingdoms. During its heyday, it would have been difficult to imagine the city of Babylon in ruins. Yet, the Bible prophets, prophets declared that this would happen. As predicted in the Bible, the Persians conquered Babylon, left it in ruins. And over time, millions of the bricks got taken away by locals to build their own houses and villages. Over the centuries that followed, due to the ravages of nature and gradual disintegration of the deserted brick structures, the city crumbled and it got buried. Eventually, the site of the city got so completely covered over, it was not known where it was. All that could be seen were sandy mounds over an area of 850 hectares, which the locals called Babel. The time actually came when it was claimed by some the city of Babylon referred to in the Bible never existed and the biblical references to it were false. But major excavation began in the area in 1899 by Robert Calderway, seen here under German auspices for 18 years, summer and winter, right through to 1917, excavation took place by his 200-man crew. This and the next few photos give you some idea of the degree to which the ancient city was uncovered.
They uncovered city walls, streets, gates, palaces, temples, houses, etc., not to mention stone carvings and cuneiform inscriptions. The main gate into the city was dedicated to Ishtar, the goddess of love and war. As this drawing shows, the gate was built double to match the two walls of the city. This half-sized replica of the gate stands at the entrance to the archaeological site at Babylon. Cold away, shipped back to the Berlin Museum, most of the treasures he found at Babylon, including the remains of one of the Ishtar gates, which you see here. This is a drawing of the street called the Processional Way, which led to and from the Ishtar Gate. The lower part of the walls that flanked it were clad with beautiful glazed bricks. The scene has been reconstructed in the Berlin Museum, as you can see here. The beautiful glazed bricks depict the Babylonian line. <clears throat> The serpent-headed dragon symbolised the god Marduk, referred to in the Bible in Jeremiah 50 verse 2 as Merodach. Merodach Baladan was the name, in fact, of one of Babylon's kings named after Marduk. But up, up until the archaeologists dug up this boundary stone on which the name Merodach Baladan is inscribed, some critics concluded Baladin in the Bible was baloney. Well, not anymore. This is another artist's impression of the processional way. References made in the Bible to Nebuchadnezzar by name about 30 times. But up until the discovery of Babylon, some believed he was a biblical myth. However, his name has been found inscribed on bricks, as you see here. The Bible says a tower was built at Babylon, and in 1903, Calderway and his team found the tower's foundation. The outline of the large square base can be seen in this aerial picture. It's 90 metres, about 300 feet square. This little cuneiform tablet found by Calderway, which belonged to an architect, is inscribed with a plan of a seven-stage tower, or ziggurat, indicating what the tower looked like, a common design at the time. It's believed the tower looks something like this. According to the tablet, the length, breadth and height of the tower were equal, so it would have been 90 metres, about 300 feet high. Babylon was certainly a great city. It's estimated that as many as 200,000 people could have lived there. It would have been hard to imagine it ending up a heap of ruins. And yet, that's what the Bible prophesied. And it prophesied it when it was in its heyday and when it seemed to be invincible. 200 years before he was born, a prophecy in Isaiah 44:45 declared that a Persian by the name of Cyrus would conquer Babylon. And that is exactly what happened. The prophecy in the Bible also stated that Cyrus would sign a decree to allow Jewish captives in Babylon return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, which they did. And you can read about that in the Bible, in the book of Ezra, and also in the prophecy of Haggai. This clay cylinder found at Babylon confirms that biblical record. It refers to Cyrus conquering Babylon and allowing the Jewish exiles to return to their homeland. It is known as Cyrus's Cylinder. To conclude this program, I'd like to just briefly say something about the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> Up the western side of the Dead Sea, there are many caves, but the caves at Quamran, indicated on the map here, are our main interest. In 1947, a 14-year-old Bedouin boy found some old pottery jars in one of the caves in this area. Some of the jars contained rolls of leather scrolls on which was unintelligible writing, which turned out to be ancient Hebrew. 
To cut a long story short, these scrolls were identified as copies of the Jewish scriptures, which we call the Old Testament of the Bible. The leading authority on the subject, Dr. Albright of Johns Hopkins University, seen here, declared that the scrolls were, quote, an amazing discovery, the greatest manuscript discovery in history. After the discovery, an extensive search in other caves took place and more scrolls were found. Eventually, Israel built this building to contain and exhibit the scrolls. It's called the Shrine of the Book. The curved roof has been designed to resemble the shape of the lids of the jars in which the scrolls were found. This is looking inside the shrine. Manuscripts are displayed around the sides. The section in the middle is designed to look like the spindle at the end of a scroll. Here we are closer to it. A scroll of Isaiah, 7.3 metres at 24 feet long, is wrapped around it. And the uh, former president of the United States, Obama, is seen here looking at it. <clears throat> Someone may wonder, well, why are the Dead Sea Scrolls so important? Well, since the original scrolls were written over 2,500 years ago, they have had to be copied many times due to wear and tear and deterioration. Knowing how easy it is to make mistakes, some critics claimed that many mistakes would have been made resulting in our Bible today being nothing like the original and therefore unreliable. However, tests have revealed the Dead Sea Scrolls are 1,000 years older than the oldest scrolls available and the texts are virtually identical. As Professor Albright said, quote, we can now treat the Bible as a genuine document of religious history. There's no scroll duggery about this book. It turned out that at Quamran, where the scrolls were found, there used to be a settlement belonging to a religious Jewish community known as the Essenes. You're looking at the ruins of that settlement here. They were very dedicated to the scriptures, which we call the Bible, an excavation of the ruins of their buildings revealed a scriptorium where they copied the scriptures. But when the Romans invaded Judea in AD 70 and were heading toward Quamran, the Essenes gathered up all their scrolls and they hid them in the caves. After hiding the scrolls, they probably headed south to Masada where the Jews made their last stand against the Romans. But as we know, the Romans built a ramp up to the fortress of Masada, fought their way in, only to find that the Jewish occupants, almost a thousand of them, had committed suicide rather than surrender. And so nobody returned to Quamran. And the scrolls sat there in the caves for almost 1,900 years until a Bedouin boy inadvertently came across them while hunting for a goat, resulting in indisputable evidence that there's no scroll duggery about the book that we call the Bible. It is a genuine record of religious history. And so the Apostle Peter went so far to say this about the scrolls. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do will that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this, <clears throat> first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And uh, we'll let the Apostle Paul have the last word on this where he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, 
thoroughly furnished unto all good works.